Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, welcome to the Tufts Research and Data Symposium for Food and Nutrition. My name is Caroline Andrews and I'm a master's student in the Agriculture, Food and Environment program here at the Friedman School, as well as a member of the Symposium's Planning Committee. This session is titled Nutrition Responses During the COVID-19 Pandemic. We will be identifying U.S. populations most impacted by food insecurity related to the pandemic, discussing disparities in nutrition services and food access, and ongoing efforts to improve food security nationwide. Before we get started, I'd like to let you know that this session is being recorded for potential publishing on our symposium website. We ask that all attendees keep their audio off until the audience-led question and answer portion um, at the end of the session. I might also suggest selecting speaker view in the upper right corner to highlight those who are presenting. Please submit any questions you may have through the chat and after speaker presentations and our moderator Q&A, we will have the audience Q&A section. We will be finishing this session about five to 10 minutes early to help facilitate transitioning to the next section. Um, with this in mind, we can get started. Um, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Meredith Niles. Meredith is an associate professor in the Department of Nutrition and Food Sciences and the Food Systems Program at the University of Vermont. She serves as the associate director of the University of Vermont's Food Systems Research Center. She is a founding member and the director of the National Food Access and COVID Research Team. Meredith's interdisciplinary research in food systems, health, and environment examines how to achieve sustainable food security. Thank you so much for being on the, on the panel today, Meredith. And whenever you're ready, please take it away. Okay, well, thank you so much, Caroline. It's lovely to be here today and also to be here with such wonderful colleagues and collaborators. I'm just gonna get my slides up and running here. So the primary um, area that I'm gonna talk about today is actually not so much to share research, but to, since this is a data uh, and research symposium, talk about a team that I've been part of um, since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I wanna start with my acknowledgements um, because this actually really hits home my major point um, about our work, which is that there has been a very large research team um, that are part of NFACT, uh, the National Food Access and COVID Research Team. Um, and this is the author list of acknowledgements um, from our first publication that came out um, uh, last year. And um, it really highlights what I think uh, was possible in the beginning of the pandemic and what I wanna focus on today. And uh, of the 61 co-authors that I had um, on this first paper and in this collaboration, I've actually only met six of them in person, which um, probably seems very relevant to a lot of our ongoing COVID uh, lifestyle. So I wanted to also start with this picture. This is from Vermont um, at the very beginning of the pandemic, March of 2020. And um, I think this really highlights uh, what a lot of us experienced at that moment in time which was really seeing empty grocery store shelves. And I think for myself, as well as many of us in the research world, um, this really highlighted to us how the pandemic fundamentally shifted food insecurity in ways. And uh, for example, it really identified that economic access was not necessarily the only way that we should be thinking about food security. Um, and though economic access has been the primary lens for understanding food insecurity um, in the US, especially through our survey instruments, um, there were many other parts of uh, food security that were affected by the pandemic. So um, for example, in this visual, you can see from my colleague, Ronnie Neff at Johns Hopkins, um, we need to be thinking about physical availability, also availability of food in general during a pandemic, uh, economic availability and accessibility, but also things like utilization, preferences, agency, and psychosocial attributes of acceptability. So um, our team that came together really wanted to comprehensively better understand some of these things um, and across varying places and people. So ultimately what we formed was NFACT, the National Food Access and COVID Research Team. 
And we are a collection of 18 study locations in 15 different states, um, as well as a national data collection effort. And you can see all of the states and the institutions that are represented um, in NFACT, including I'm pleased to say the Greater Boston Food Bank, which is um, participating in this panel today as well. So what I mostly wanted to think about uh, with all of you today was how this was possible, how this group of people could come together and what we did and also what was challenging or what maybe worked well. So how did NFACT happen? What was some of the early work that was necessary? And, and really, I think this was around collaboration, open sourcing and open access, as well as a focus on public and policy outputs. So in terms of collaboration, um, our work initially started with myself, at least, by reaching out to other collaborators at Johns Hopkins at the very start of the pandemic, which eventually snowballed as we heard about other people who were thinking about um, understanding what was happening with food security during the pandemic. Um, and that really enabled us to reach out to new collaborators, people we'd never connected with before that we had peripheral relationships with, and from the very beginning, think about how to collaborate um, to maximize our impact. We also did a lot of stakeholder engagement right away um, in Vermont and beyond among all the collaborators. So connecting with organizations, agencies, and policymakers. And I'll add that this collaboration was incredibly important to leverage resources. You know, none of us had a grant to study the impact of the pandemic on food security at the moment because we didn't know the pandemic was gonna happen. So coming together really helped us leverage resources um, and enable us to collect data very quickly. One other thing that was really critical um, for this early work was we open sourced our survey instrument. Um, and so because we made the survey instrument publicly available to anyone that wanted to use it, it really enabled a lot of researchers to um, want to work with us and grew our team in really new and exciting ways. And we continue to open source our instrument and share the survey instrument fully um, integrated into Qualtrics and integrated into the survey platform for any of our collaborators. And then we also focused on public and policy-driven outputs. Um, so we collected our first data in March and April, re released our first research briefs to the public in April of 2020, and published our first open access article in July of 2020. Um, we used a survey instrument, um, either in whole or in part, across all of our survey sites. And we used the USDA six-item food security module. So we had a standardized way of asking about food security. Um, because of various reasons, which I can talk about in the discussion, we had three different kinds of recruitment strategies across all of our sites. And we were able to group those and furthermore down the road, able to compare how recruitment strategies affected food security outcomes, for example. So we had convenience sampling, representative sampling, and targeting of high-risk populations. Um, here you can see all of the surveys that were released across all of our institutions um, as of uh, the first publication that we collectively published. Um, so this was something else that we had to think about, um, but you can see that we spanned um, the first nine months of the pandemic across our many locations. And just to give you a brief snapshot, it's my only results slide. Um, we did find across all of our sites, there was an increase in food insecurity since the pandemic, um, and we were also looking at that documented change um, during the pandemic across different kinds of sites as well. And the increase uh, in food insecurity ranged from between a 28% increase to a 55% increase among, among our representative samples. So just to wrap up, um, we're also in the process now of integrating all of this data. So we have data from more than 27,000 people about their experiences in the first year of the pandemic and beyond. We're continuing surveys. Um, and we're now bringing all of that together um, into a common database that'll allow us to explore and do deeper analyses across states and regions and survey types. And we're also integrating this um, with COVID-19 prevalence data and policy comparisons to look at this data further. So I'll wrap up just by sharing, um, if you're interested in our work further, um, we have a website, NFACT, um, research, or sorry, nfactresearch.org. We have 48 policy briefs across 15 study states there, plus all of our publications. And our survey instruments are publicly available on Harvard Dataverse. So I look forward to talking more about our experience um, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. 
Thank you so much, Meredith. Our next presenter is going to be Jerry Henchy. She is the Director of Nutrition Policy at the Food Research and Action Center. Jerry is the co-author of the recently released FRAC report titled Hunger, Poverty, and Health Disparities During COVID-19 and the Federal Nutrition Program's Role in an Equitable Recovery, which examines the linkages between hunger, poverty, health, and equity during the pandemic. She is also the current chair of the policy committee of the American Public Health Association's Food and Nutrition Section. Thank you so much for being here today, Jerry, and you can get started when you're ready. Right. Well, thank you very much, Carolyn. I'm happy to be here today and to get a grip on my PowerPoint here. Um, I'm really happy to be here today uh, to be part of the Tufts Student Symposium. It's really exciting and a lot of exciting energy as uh, everyone is got their new thinking and is really looking on building their careers. So happy to be here today and happy to be on this um, August panel uh, with all these um, important advocates and researchers for food insecurity and health who did great work during COVID. So what I'm going to be um, looking at really is if we think about COVID-19 nutrition responses, systems challenges, opportunities and policy implications, I'm gonna talk about food insecurity and health disparities during COVID and equities imp impacts just briefly um, to say a little bit more built on the great presentation about impact. And then really I'm gonna look at maximizing the utility of the federal food programs during COVID-19 and there, what were the systems challenges, policy implications and process. So as we know, we just heard, um, in fact, was one of the many important surveys that happened. Uh, and in addition to some government surveys and some other surveys, and they all showed what we heard about from Emily, which is that there, were, there was really an unacceptably high amount of food insecurity that was going on and is still going on. And one of the things that we saw throughout, as we heard, is there were stark racial disparities. Now, of course, for those of us who follow food insecurity all the time, which is many of the people on this panel, there have always been stark disparities. It's just that no one was paying attention to them. So that's one of the advantages, I think, of the research, for example, that in fact did um, and other research, because it really showed this and it showed that it was even worse during COVID. Um, you saw, you know, point, several point increases in the disparities as well as a continuation of the disparities. And some of the harder hit populations are, of course, um, families that had children, families or individuals who identify as representing racial and ethnic groups that have been marginalized, and families that had at least one household member who had lost their jobs or had their hours cut back due to the pandemic. And we did just see um, one of the studies that just came out was the CDC study that just came out at the end of February. And they showed from 2019 to 2020 that, you know, a little over 10% of the children uh, were food insecure. And that's 6.5% for white children, and then 15.7% for Hispanic children and 18.8% um, for Black children. So all of this is consistent with um, the really great findings from IMPACT as well. So this is the publication that Carolyn was talking about that we did. Um, Alison Lacko from, from FRAC is my colleague. She's the co-author and really actually the lead author on this publication. Um, and I invite you to read it. It's really um, full of lots of important summaries of what went on and connections around the intersectionalities with food insecurity, health, um, and food access during COVID-19. So let me turn now just quickly, maximizing the utility of the federal food programs during COVID. These were the driving factors in food insecurity that related to that. So high unemployment rates, disruption of the food supply, which we saw a picture of, and racial discrimination. Food insecurity is associated with a wide range of serious consequences, and we really have to be thinking about those when we think about what were the many things that needed to be done. And part of what needed to be done is that we really had to maximize the food programs because they're a tremendous resource within the American food system. So what were the challenges to doing that with the federal food programs? 
One, we had rapidly increasing need. Two, the social distancing shut down the normal locations and operations like school and WIC. And then four, the food system was disrupted, supply chain disrupted and uh, demand shifts. So what were the steps in terms of thinking of systems and policy, if you think about maximizing the food programs? And go backwards. One, identify need and solutions. Two, secure congressional action, which is flexibilities, expansions, and funding. Three, administrative action. So USDA has to then translate it out to the states. Four, fully implement on the state and local level. And then what were the lessons learned? What needed to be fixed? What needed to be extended? And then seeking additional and permanent improvements. And so we've been through that cycle several times during COVID. And now, you know, we're at, at the end of it where we're trying to seek and, you know, continuations of the waivers and the flexibilities we have, but also to make some of those permanent because they really worked well. So in terms of thinking um, additional and permanent improvements, the specifics, we have um, streamlining. So maintaining the program flexibilities and the expanded eligibilities like free healthy school meals for all, summer EBT, um, modernize client facing technology and paperwork reduction, for example, online ordering and people being able to get WIC services over the phone, enhance the benefits. And we already have seen this happen. The Thrifty Food Plan was revised for SNAP. And so that really matters um, and that's permanent. And um, we're going to the WIC food pack, which was plussed up. So we have way more fruits and vegetables, you know, instead of $9 a month, $24 a month for kids, instead of $11 a month for, for moms, we've got $40. Addressing racial inequities in the program, streamlining helps to do some of that, but there's a lot more that has to be done. And USDA does have a racial equity commission. And then shifting to integrate local and smaller producers into the commodity programs. Those are also things that were learned. And those are specific in part to um, FDIPR, which is food distribution on Indian reservations and TFAP, which is emergency commodities as well as school commodities. So uh, seeking additional and permanent improvements, we have this new, what is still relatively new um, administration and new in particular compared to the last one. So we have President Biden and, and uh, Vice President Harris. So they are issuing various executive orders, also administrative action. So that thrifty food plan change, that was administrative action, it's permanent. It was within what had been directed as an area of action within the last farm bill. And then they can propose legislative action, which they've done. So for example, bid, build back better. And then if we are again looking at seeking additional and permanent improvements, what's next? So we have the economic stimulus bills, the build, build Back Better, that's a reconciliation process. Reconciliation, you don't have to pay the bills. So people like reconciliations. You can only do it once a year. And unless something really terrible is going on, they don't do it at all. Um, and it's because of COVID that we have this as a possibility. The other thing that's going on is the child nutrition reauthorization, which is an opportunity to embed some of these changes permanently. And then next year will be the farm bill, which is SNAP, but that starts this year. So all the hearings start this year and then they'll pass it next year. The one other thing congressional, from the point of view of congressional action is the omnibus. You hear a lot about the omnibus. The omnibus is actually them just trying to pay the bills so they were supposed to pay them at the end of the fiscal year. That's their job. It's called appropriations. They haven't done it yet. So they're bundling it all together and trying to move it. That's where we want to see the waivers that are currently in place for the um, federal food programs. We want them to continue. And the omnibus is where we would see that happen at this point, that authority that would allow USDA to continue the waivers. So that's it. That's my presentation. And I want to um, also just say really quickly that we have two jobs that we're gonna be posting. So this is a good audience to tell that to. Um, they should be up pretty soon. All right, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Carolyn. Awesome, thank you so much, Jerry, uh, for that overview. And yes, this is definitely a good audience to, um, to mention the jobs. Um, 
So thank you. I want to uh, bring it over next to Adrienne Worthington. Um, she is a registered dietitian and the director of nutrition programs at the Greater Boston Food Bank. In this role, Adrienne oversees activities, including creating public facing materials, managing the food bank's online recipe database, and ensuring internal compliance with the food bank's formal nutrition policy. She oversees the SNAP team's advocacy, outreach, and application assistance. Adrienne holds a Master's of Education, a Bachelor of Science in Nutrition and Dietetics, and an Associate's Degree in Culinary Science. Um, we're really excited to have you here today, Adrienne. Um, take it away when you're ready. All right, can everybody see my screen okay? Are we good to go? All right, perfect. So thank you so much for having me here today. I'm really honored to participate and I'm looking forward to the dialogue that we're gonna be having. So today I'm going to give you a brief overview of some statistics on food insecurity in Massachusetts, how a food bank operates and some of the ways the operation has changed during the pandemic to reach more people in need. <clears throat> so the most recent food insecurity projections are that one in 10 people and one in nine children in Massachusetts are food insecure. And it probably isn't surprising to anybody in this room that food insecurity increased during the pandemic. So moving from one in 13 people, one in 13 children to pre-pandemic to these numbers that we're seeing today. And one point that I think is really important to recognize is that while the terms hunger and food insecurity are used interchangeably, they're not the same thing. Hunger refers to a personal physical sensation of discomfort, while food insecurity refers to a lack of available financial resources for food at the household level. So a food bank, it's a not-for-profit food recovery and distribution program that's dedicated to reducing hunger and malnutrition by supplementing the feeding programs of charitable organizations that serve people directly who are in need. And so GBFB, or the Greater Boston Food Bank, has over 600 partner sites that receive food from the food bank. And so each one is a standalone nonprofit. So GBFB doesn't own or run any of them. They're all members of the food bank network. Many of them order food from our inventory online and then come directly to the main building, main food bank building, which you'll see behind me, to pick it up. <clears throat> In some areas, we have facilitated drops. So the food bank will go and directly drop food to a large agency, or we have facilitated relationships with vendors. So the food vendors are going directly to the agencies with cutting the food bank out of the middle. So it's just going directly to these sites. So of those 600 plus partners that the food bank has, about 90% of them are food pantries. And a food pantry, it is set up like a store or a small retail operation. And pre-COVID, most of them were set up where foods are displayed on shelves and in refrigerator cases, and clients can go in and select the foods that they want, the ones that they want to bring home. And the quantity was usually based on household size. And many of our partners are currently still operating under COVID-19 protocols, where foods are either pre-bagged and offered to clients outside or in drive-up models. Some of these sites have been able to incorporate the client choice into their models, like using order forms where clients can select from their own inventory or by assigning volunteers that walk the line with a checklist and a list of inventory and clients can let them know what they want. And then they go back in pre-pack it so that it's ready to go when the client comes to the front of the line. And so because our partners vary so widely in size and in their capacity, most are volunteer run as well, there is no one way or one size fits all. But there, one thing that really is consistent across all of the GBFB partners is that the food and the non-food items that they're distributing is always free to clients. And agencies that are members of the food bank are expected to serve anybody who comes to their door. So food banks have specific territories or service areas that they serve. And GBFB, we serve about 190 cities and towns in the nine easternmost counties of the state of Massachusetts. There's one food bank that serves Worcester County, which is right in the middle of the state. And there's another food bank in the western part of the state, the Food Bank of Western Mass, that serves the four westernmost counties. And this photo is from the map that GBFB uses to track how much food is going into a community, 
the estimated food insecurity rate in that community, and how much more is needed for everybody in need to access three meals a day. And this map is updated regularly and can be accessed using that web address here on the screen. So in the last fiscal year, which ended on September 30th, GBFB distributed over 117 million pounds of food. And of that, 24% was produce and 28% was protein and dairy. And in fiscal 21, 92% of that food met healthful, nutri healthful nutrition standards. So we do have a formalized nutrition policy in place that guides decision making when GBFB is purchasing foods. And we've had to switch over into mostly purchasing foods because of lack of their supply chain issues. A lot of organizations are no longer donating food because they're, they're really shoring up on their waste, which is great in terms of food waste, but not so great for the, a lot of the food organizations that rely on donations. But because we have this policy in place, we were really able to ramp up the nutritional quality of the foods distributed. We do run a nutrition analysis on all foods that come into the building. It, it, it's a traffic light labeling system that designates foods, either a green, a yellow, or a red based on the saturated fat, sodium and added sugar content of the food. And our partners can see these labels, either a green, a yellow or a red dot next to the food when they're placing an order on the ordering system. And this system was actually created by a Friedman alum, Dr. Katie Martin, who was advised by Dr. B. Rogers. So this is something that came out of a Friedman alumna. And so GBFB, we saw a historic surge in need when the pandemic hit in 2020. And the agency network is still reporting serving similar numbers of people that they saw when the pandemic's economic effects really took hold. And there have been a lot of changes. And some, some of them are we distribute grocery cards to agencies to give directly to clients. And this is something that has historically only been done around the holidays. So agencies started to serve more people, but their physical capacity didn't grow. And so these gift cards, which range between $20 and $40, have really helped mitigate the balance between physical capacity, physical inventory, and the number that these agencies are serving. Agencies with a lot of capacity, and I know I'd mentioned this before, but they're able to accept, accept large shipments of food at one time. And this saves time and resources on the food bank level, but also on the agency's level, so they don't have to come into Boston, pick up the food, and bring it back to their site. We had a bunch of new partnerships, and these all came out of necessity. Um, there have been dozens of new partnerships, but I really want to highlight the YMCA Boston. So why the Y in Boston, it's not a food distribution organization, but they came on as an agency partner and they now distribute foods from at least 20 of their Boston YMCA sites. They also offer a home delivery, which is really crucial for people who cannot leave their homes. And in this short amount of time that they've been on board with us, they are now the third largest distribution partner across our entire agency network, which is huge. They've really ramped it up. Another thing that we changed is right before the pandemic happened, the SNAP team moved over into a digital space where people can self-refer to services via the web. And the team connects with them for screening, for application assistance, or for case assistance if they're already a SNAP participant. And the team saw a tripling of number of calls and requests in the first couple of months of the pandemic, so much so that we had two full-time people redeploy from other teams to come help us field some of these calls. This was one of the only SNAP partners in the state that did not have to slow down their assistance because they were already working and functioning in a digital space. And so last year, they submitted over 900 SNAP applications for folks. And the highest, that was the highest number across the state. And 76% of those applications were approved for SNAP benefits. And that's a really big number to see. The person who leads the SNAP team, Krista Mayfield, is also a Friedman alum. She came out of the Agriculture, Food, and Environment program. So there's a lot of Tufts incorporated into the food banking work across the country. And then finally, we were awarded up to $17 million in reimbursable costs through the ARPA fund, which is the American Recovery Plan Act. And the way that the food bank intends to spend this is to increase the refrigerated space in the building. So build out the building and change the spaces around. So we do have more refrigerated space for more perishable items. Purchasing two remote distribution locations, north and south of the city. So they kind of be like satellite warehouses so that partner agencies that are located north and south of the city no longer would have to drive into and out of Boston. Right now, the traffic's not so bad, but when people start going back to work, traffic is a little crazy in the city of Boston. 
And then finally, we're about going, we're planning to flood about five million of those dollars into the agency network to specifically help them build out their physical capacity so that they can serve more people. And that was a brief overview. Please connect with us. Here's my contact information and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Adrian. And I love all those uh, Friedman connections to the food bank. That's awesome. Um, so our last presentation today will be from a current Friedman student. Um, Captain Emily Sanchez is a United States Army active duty registered dietitian. At the start of the pandemic, she was mobilized to the 11th Field Hospital in New York City and stood up nutrition operations at the Javits New York Medical Station. Emily is a second year PhD candidate here at the Friedman School, studying nutritional epidemiology and data science as part of the Army's long-term health and education training program. Thank you uh, so much for being here, Emily, on your busy symposium schedule. Uh, take it away when you're ready. Great. Thank you, Caroline. And yeah, it's fun switching hats from uh, committee member to presenter. So thank you all for uh, joining us today. Okay. So diving into it, actually, let me minimize this. Uh, the views and information presented today are my own, and they do not represent the official position of the U.S. Army Medical Center of Excellence, the U.S. Army Training Doctrine Command, or the Departments of Army, Department of Defense, or the U.S. Government. And Caroline, you gave a great introduction, so I'm actually going to just dive into sort of this intersect of, of my work experience and sort of where I'm at in that today I'll be focusing on the time I served as the chief of nutrition operations at the Javits New York Medical Station, which I'll refer to as JNYMS going forward uh, in response to COVID-19. And how here at Friedman, I was able to reflect and share that experience through my first first author publication, um, which I'll highlight throughout the, the presentation. You may remember that the first case of COVID-19 was not seen in the United States until January 20th of 2020, with the first reported death following on February 6th. By the end of February, the Department of Defense established the DOD COVID-19 task force, and on March 13th, President Trump declared the COVID-19 outbreak a national emergency. Just under two weeks later, on March 25th, the U.S. Army issued deployment orders to three combat support hospitals for New York and Washington State, where COVID cases were significantly increasing and medical capabilities and capacities were strained. Today's presentation will focus on the events between March 27th and May 1st when JNYMS was operational. I mobilized with the 1st Medical Brigade's 9th Hospital Center, 11th Field Hospital, in order to serve as their field hospital dietitian. We were there with 42 other state and federal agencies to provide temporary and scalable medical staff to the state of New York and provide care for non-COVID patients, which quickly changed to treating COVID patients. On day one of operations, we had 500, uh, 500 bed field hospital inside the Javits Convention Center, but we were told to prepare operations for expansion upward to 2000 beds. What did this mean for us as nutrition professionals? We needed to adapt from a medical treatment facility mindset to emergency medicine and emergency feeding. And with our own manpower strains, our first priority was to make sure each and every patient admitted to the hospital was fed, while our second priority was supporting them clinically. On the left, we've highlighted the location of the Javits Convention Center, which is in the Hudson Yards area of Lower Manhattan. And on the right, through a multi-panel time series plot, you can see the trend in COVID-19 cases per 100,000 persons, deaths per 100,000 persons, and hospital ICU bed availability while JNYMS was operational. And here we have a workflow process diagram of nutrition operations at JNYMS. On the left, you'll see food service operations, and on the right, new clinical nutrition operations. And the different color boxes represent key personnel providing medical nutrition, medical nutrition for admitted patients and the shapes represent varying workflow steps. So this is a very broad overview of the sort of day-to-day -day, um, processes and workflow of patients, but it's just to give you a sense of really how complex it was. And during the approximately six weeks uh, we were operational, the nutrition operations team screened nearly 1,100 patients all within 24 hours of admissions. We provided individualized nutrition therapy for over 230 patients, given the respective RD staff count that you can see 
in the middle panel on the figure of the right. And we delivered over 15,000 meals. From this experience, the greatest lesson learned was to remain flexible and adaptable. With mission and operational guidelines and capabilities changing daily, we had to get creative with minimal resources, which led me to think, how would we better prepare future responders? And if you were able to attend our keynote address about an hour ago, Dr. Nathaniel Newlands touched on the fact that in the face of a disaster or crisis, we are often reactive, which is in part due to a lack of coordination and planning. So how can we shift this process from a reactive one to a proactive one? And what tools and resources are available and accessible to nutrition professionals following short notice for mobilization? This led uh, to myself and two of the New York State Department of Health dietitians that were later mobilized to JNYMS deciding to share our experience. We began writing a manuscript. Fast forward six months later, I moved to Boston. I began my PhD program. And like all things in 2020 through 2021, and I'd say even now, I was in a virtual research meeting with a peer, Ryan Simpson, and we were actually discussing the challenges of the semester and parallel projects we had going on with school work. So typical PhD conversations. Um, and I shared with him the work Amy, Mike, and I were doing. And with his experience in data science, we began discussing how we could standardize humanitarian and emergency response frameworks for nutrition services. This led to team expansion, and we recruited from the Tufts Initiative for the Forecasting and Modeling of Infectious Diseases Lab, Maya Tarnas, and my academic advisor, Dr. Elena Naumova, who both helped immensely in the literature review, editing of visual aids, and development of standardized tools and pro project supervision. Additionally, we recruited Lieutenant Colonel uh, Jared McGee, who served as the 11th Field Hospital Commander and 9th Hospital center deputy commander during our time of mobilization. And he provided expertise on military field hop hospital operations and civilian augmentation recommendations. In the summer of 2021, we officially published the case report seen here, and you can access that through the QR code on the right, where we review in more detail many of the challenges faced within food service and clinical operations, in addition to proposed solutions. Um, I am gonna, for the sake of time, uh, go skip these slides. If we have time to go um, back for question and answer, I'd be happy to review challenges and solutions faced within food service operations, within clinical operations, and also when we had to hand off our operations to the state of New York. But ultimately, through reflection of this experience, while at Tufts, the research team then created a centralized location of the necessary tools and resources for operating nutrition services in an emergency setting. The Nutrition Response Toolkit for Humanitarian Crises is a publicly available resource and free uh, that includes recommendations for how to establish nutrition operations in a field hospital. And it includes staffing and training models, census and diet order trackers, food temperature logs, modified malnutrition screening forms and clinical communication tools, uh, in addition to an enteral nutrition formulary with nutrition support calculators. And looking ahead, we hope this current version of the toolkit is the first of many. We look forward to collaborating with research and practice communities to evaluate the toolkit through validation studies and develop guidelines for nutrition services in field hospitals and temporary medical facilities responding to humanitarian crises. And lastly, to my fellow students, I want to encourage you all to leverage your diverse and rich backgrounds in order to inspire and explore new areas of research with the connections you are working uh, or making, excuse me, while you're in school. Studying at Friedman has really afforded me the time to reflect on my personal experience responding to COVID, and it elevated the way I gave back to the profession of nutrition and dietetics. It started with a simple conversation amongst peers and grew into a really wonderful and, and rich experience that I hope you all will similarly get to enjoy. I look forward to your questions in the conversation. Great, thank you so much, Emily. Um, and let's see, we can go on to the Q&A portion. Um, I do have a question to kick us off, but if anyone does have additional questions you'd like to add, um, you can feel free to put them in the chat and we will try to get to them. 
Um, so my first question, I think it's wonderful you all have such um, diverse backgrounds and perspectives um, coming into the topic of food insecurity and how COVID has impacted it domestically. Um, and so I guess looking towards the future and maybe Emily, if you want to start um, given the couple slides you had, um, I wanted to ask, what are some of the large scale actions you feel are needed um, to continue to address food insecurity in the US that could be at a local, a state or national level? Um, and who do you feel is responsible for implementing these changes? Um, maybe public or private sector, government, academia, or potentially partnerships um, to implement some of these practices. And I'm wondering if you feel partnerships across these different sectors um, would be good long-term strategies for building greater resilience in our domestic food security. So I don't know, Emily, if you want to kick off, and this is for all of our presenters. Yeah, absolutely. And I can just say personally, this was my first you know, live operation where we're reaching across the table and working with a lot of um, civilian organizations. So the systems we have in place as military health responders didn't always align or, or harmonize easily with what the state of New York had. So I think that's a more global issue of looking at data science and creating the systems that can crosstalk and work in a variety of settings just not instead of uh, like just what I'm in every day and what you're in every day, because we don't know when these um, crises are going to come, right? So these are the, the unexpected, unpredictable chances um, where we have to deploy these, these tools and resources, but we can't, um, I guess, forget to, to prepare for that. So um, during my time here, we actually turned to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, said, what's available? Is there a place where humanitarian response has a home? Um, that we're just not seeing. Um, and so I think that might be a good start as, as a dietitian, that's where I turned to first. And I had tools and resources from working in a hospital setting, but it, I couldn't necessarily apply those um, in an emergency situation. So from a, I guess, organization standpoint, I'd love to see that come from our main channels of commu uh, nutrition communication and policy, which would to me be the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's great. Um, let's see, Jerry, do you wanna go next? Sure, I, I think, you know, I think actually this panel is like a good, good answer of all the different partnerships of people who work together in various different ways or sectors that work together in various different ways. Cause I feel like, you know, research, you know, clinical, the sectors that step forward there and the emergency food network were all really, really important. And then my sector is the advocacy sector. So going forward, like hearing from everyone and then figuring out at this point, we have a big concentration on action that needs to happen on the federal legislative front, right? So we really want to get the waivers, you know, continued. We would like people to understand saying about well what needs to be ready next time if there's another disaster in all the different sectors that's also important um, but we really we need the waivers to go on and then we need to say what are the things that really worked here that we need to continue right because there is always a certain level of need and anytime you have this kind of problem that's this big there's a whole set of people that are gonna take a long time to get back to where they were. And so we saw that, for example, in the recession, it took a, you know, food insecurity went up and it took a long time, you know, for things to get back to normal. So, and there were always things that we wanted, but people wouldn't give us because they thought that the poor weren't deserving. So at this moment, this concept of people being deserving, even if they don't have resources and they're hungry, People really feel that way. They feel like, oh, we're all in this together. You know, this, people didn't do anything. They're not lazy. They just don't have food. So we really want to take this opportunity to get some of these things to be permanent um, because there's going to be a really serious hunger cliff. Uh, if when the, for example, when the SNAP um, plus ups uh, drop out and when the, once there's no pandemic, um, declaration anymore, there'll be an average drop of like $82 a month in SNAP benefits. And 
Adrian's people are going to, you know, they've got long lines. Now they're going to have even longer lines if that happens without any kind of help or assistance. Um, so that kind of stuff. Everyone's getting free school breakfast and lunch now. If they stop, then they've got to pay. If they have to pay for it, then again, that's going to impact budgets. That's going to put people over the edge. They're, they're going to need emergency assistance. And the only other thing, other two things I would say rel relative to this panel, research was really important, what Meredith did and her, the open sourcing of that um, survey instrument was super helpful. And Meredith's colleagues came to advocates, went to, you know, Feeding America and, and really talked to us and told us what they found and we used it to try to really make the case. So we got some of those changes. So I think research is absolutely key in the fact that in fact did that in a way that really was, was an important partnership way is meaningful. And, and going forward, I think that the USDA and NIH's research uh, agendas need to take that into account. They need to fund that. And there, there was a request for comments on that. Um, and I know Frack put them in and other people did, but um, we did, we actually, in terms of partnership, um, the Food Research and Action Center does a conference every year with the Feeding America, which is the, which is Adrian's national um, organization. So that we're having that in, um, well, it's the 15th and 16th of this month if people want to go to it. I can put a link in the chat, but that's our, that's a big partnership that's coming up. <laughs> Great, thank you, Jerry. Uh, Meredith or Adrian, do you have any additional thoughts? Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, first of all, I will highly elevate what Jerry just said. You know, I think that we need, there are mandates in, in federal funding for open access and public access to data or to uh, publications, but they're embargoed for up to a year and it's on the back end of the project. And, and what we did in NFACT was build in those collaborations and build in the open sourcing from the beginning so that the work was usable from the second we finished the data analysis. So I just think that's so critical. And if we could reorganize the way we think about and fund research to, to catalyze that, I think that's really important. Um, but the bigger point I wanted to actually make was I think that we need to, uh, both in the policy realm and in the research realm and the advocacy and nonprofit realm, we, we have to better tie all of the challenges of, of uh, basic needs that, that people are facing. And so, for example, in our, in our analysis and our work, the majority of food insecure at this point, um, and even during the pandemic, uh, we're working. Right, so it's not this idea that we have um, we have people who are not working and who are on government programs. The majority of the food insecure in our most recent data from uh, last year was that um, insecure people are working, and um, and they're just not getting paid very much, quite frankly. Um, and so, it really highlights, I think, the the connection between working wages, living wages um, efforts, as well as food security, and then also the connection of food security to health. Um, our work more recently has focused on sort of the longer term implications of all of these people being food insecure and what it means for their health and well-being. And we have found that uh, food insecure households are significantly more likely to suffer from anxiety and depression since the pandemic, more likely to skip and stop medications, um, and more likely to have, of course, unstable housing. And so this is really a, a collection of basic needs. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity, I think, to couple in the research world and the advocacy world, um, these things together, because um, we need to be coupling uh, benefits and resources for people when they go to places uh, like the Greater Boston Food Bank, and they could get a medication voucher at the same time they're picking up food assistance, for example, and learn about housing opportunities. So I think there's a, a great opportunity for a wider coalition of of people, including in the research world, to better understand the complexity of these, these things together. And I, Meredith, you took pretty much the words out of my mouth, which is great. <laughs> and so I wanna echo what like everybody has just said here. And I think it's really important that folks understand that food insecurity doesn't exist in a silo. It doesn't exist on its own. There are all sorts of other factors that are impacting somebody's life. And food insecurity is one of them. Food insecurity is a symptom. And so it, working with having organizations, and I'm, 
in, instead of looking on the policy level, like more on, on the ground level and in the, the community organization level, a lot of organizations are doing a lot of really great work. However, there isn't a consistent communication between organizations. So I would love to be able to see different resource hubs where somebody can go and absolutely pick up food that they need like from a pantry, but also learn about courses that are available at a community center, or maybe you get a blood pressure check or what, what that's like to have it be one resource hub. And so that's something I would like to see. And I know that there are some organizations, I know Connecticut Food Bank is and food share in Connecticut are starting to like work with agencies to start building out these hubs. So we're keeping our eyes on the team down in Connecticut to see how that's going to see if we can bring some of that into Massachusetts. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I know we're quickly running out of time. Um, I do want to ask one final question, though. Um, and if, if any of you have um, thoughts on this, um, with the loss of income and jobs that a lot of people have had during the pandemic, I'm wondering if any of you could speak to um, the role that stigma might have played in requesting um, help in getting nutritious food or um, barriers that they might have faced. Um, I think, you know, kind of talking more about the social and emotional aspects of food insecurity is, is also pretty critical. So if anybody has thoughts on that. I can speak about it briefly. We just, Alison Lacko, my colleague and, and our boss just did a blog on stigma because it, I think it is a really good question. I think two things happened during COVID. Um, one of them is actually the stigma associated with needing help with food was actually less than it usually was. So people, um, there were more people who were willing to say, I just, I have to go to the food pantry and I'm gonna be in a long line and everyone's gonna see me, but there's a lot of people there. So it was a little bit, little bit different, but then on the other hand, um, it, it certainly was still there. And what we saw in the changes in the federal food program rules diminished stigma, right? So made it easier to get on, made it so you could do it remotely. So nobody would see what you were doing. Um, you know, so I think some of the rules really helped with stigma, but also this really this change in that there were so many people that needed help that had never needed help before that it really changed it. And it also changed the way the system saw it. So you saw county government paying attention to emergency food providers um, and directing ARPA money to emergency food providers in counties that would never have done that before because they just didn't have enough people who were hungry as far as they were concerned to hit critical mass. So I feel like it's both those things. We saw procedurally from the system's point of view how to drop stigma, but we also saw that there was less stigma overall because people weren't getting blamed for having to be in the line to get the food. If I could just weigh in with some data we have about this, Caroline. Um, so we've asked a number of questions uh, in our surveys about perceptions of stigma, about people's worries about using certain programs or various aspects. Um, and I completely agree with what Jerry said in terms of um, early on, because it was more common uh, that stigma was reduced, but we do actually have some data to suggest that that has changed. Um, and we actually have documented an increase in uh, perceived stigma as the pandemic has gone on. So while um, early on in the pandemic, when I think you know, we really all saw that there were long lines and, and uh, that a lot of people experienced job loss, that the stigma was reduced. But um, we followed a cohort of Vermonters over the first year of the pandemic. And among those people that used food assistance programs in June 2020 compared to March 2021, we saw an increase in uh, stigma um, perceptions, meaning people were more worried, for example, that people would find out about their use of those programs um, than they were early on in the pandemic. So I do wonder if this will change. And I think there is a misperception right now in the broader sort of policy world and even the media world that, oh, unemployment is so low and everybody's back to work. And so how are people still hungry? How is this still happening? And um, I think as those conversations continue to perpetuate, which I'm hearing from various people, um, that will only further the stigma of potential need that people might have. Great, Adrian or Emily, do you have any other thoughts? No, 
Okay. I put well, the blog in the in the um in the chat. It's because I would just raise that the other thing the research shows, and I'm sure Meredith has this as well, is that stigma it can be worse um, based on race and ethnicity because the way people are treated is work can be worse based on race and ethnicity. And I'm in this case speaking about the food programs. Um, so that's one thing that we saw. I'm sure Meredith, you know, you saw that as well. Great, thank you both for adding. Um, Meredith, I see you also added to the chat um, further information for people to look at. Um, and I think both of your points kind of speak to this being a fluid situation and things, you know, everything's dynamic and things are changing. Um, and so it'll be interesting to kind of keep the data coming and see, um, see how things change. But we are very quickly running out of time. So I do want to say a massive thank you again to Meredith, Jerry, Adrian, and Emily for your presentations and for your thoughts in the Q&A. Um, and thank you to all of our participants for watching this session. Um, and please join us back at 2 p.m. for our next few panels. Um, but thank you all so much. <laughs>